got it. Good morning. Hey, thanks for taking time again to be here with us to celebrate this wonderful Sunday. As Pastor Mark mentioned, it is Palm Sunday, uh, but we've been connecting every single week with this theme of things that we want to leave behind in our lives. And I have to tell you, uh, I'm excited about this one. This one's, this one's easy for me to leave behind today. Before I get to what it is, uh, I don't know if you're anything like me, but... Uh, Ever since I was young, my sense of hearing has been super good. I can hear the smallest things ever. Uh, I, can, I can hear things from long distance. I can tell you what conversation somebody's having at a restaurant like 18 tables over from me. But it's also super annoying at times, too, because every uh, small sound, uh, it can bother me. So like that uh, small little rattle in a car, and you're driving for like six hours and nobody else can hear it, but I can hear it. Or <clears throat> you go to the movie theater and there's somebody uh, eight rows over from you and uh, they're just whispering, but they're whispering throughout the whole movie. I can't pay attention at all. Or even the smallest noises in the middle of the night, the, the tiniest little things, uh, they always wake me up. And then uh, loud noises, the same thing. Uh, they, really, they really penetrate my ears. So anytime anybody says, hey, the contemporary worship seemed a little loud today, I always tell them, yeah, I, I, I hear you. I know exactly where you're, where you're coming from. Uh, and today, uh, we want to talk about loud noises. We want to talk about clamor that is around us and leaving clamor and leaving noise behind. Uh, now, I'm not just talking about physical noise that we hear, but I'm talking about the noises that the world throws at you. Uh, all the messages, all the clamor, uh, all the, the, the flat-out temptation that we receive in the world and how to get rid of that. Today in our gospel text that Craig read for us, there is a lot of clamor going on. There's a, a lot of noise in a lot of different ways. So I wanted to review that with you today from John chapter 12. We hear the words, the next day, uh, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. <clears throat> All right, it says the next day there, uh, just so you know what has happened, uh, there's this big like luncheon that is happening in celebration of Jesus. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus are all gathered and kind of throwing this party uh, for him. And during this time, people hear that Jesus is coming into town. And they're really excited because this is after Jesus has raised Lazarus from the, the dead. And people want to come and see both the miracle worker and also the miracle, the, the evidence. They knew that Lazarus was dead. And so they want to come and to be able to, to see him. And there's this huge festival that's taking place. Uh, Place during this time. Uh, some translations will say the feast. And it's talking about the feast of the Passover. Uh, all the people are gathered to be able to celebrate uh, God saving them from uh, the, their uh, bondage that they had from the Egyptians in their, their past. And so during this time, it's massive. There's a, there's a lot of people who are gathered in town, a, a huge, huge gathering. So when it talks about this great crowd, I want you to understand how big this crowd is. Uh, during this time in the city of Scottsdale, it's probably one of our highest times for having uh, all of our people here, right? All of our snowbirds are here right now. We get a lot of visitors coming during this time. Uh, we have a lot of people that come from out of town to see spring training or different events like that. So the population of Scottsdale, and I know you know this too, because if you drive out on Scottsdale Road uh, later on, you know that the traffic is like at a peak, right? It's at an all-time peak. So in our city of, of Scottsdale, all of it, from the northernmost part to the southernmost part, uh, we have not quite 250,000 people who live in that in entire city. So the estimation of how many people gather for this great celebration, this great festival, is about 2 million people. So take our population, multiply it by a little over 8, and put them all in one area. That's what the traffic is like in this town. So think about that, that crowd on this day as John continues to share this account with us. 
He says, they took palm branches and they went out to meet him, to meet Jesus. And they're shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Imagine what that must have been like to be there on that day. All of those people coming out to yell those words, Hosanna to the Lord, to their savior. Uh, That word Hosanna translates into please save or save now. And that's what the people want. I bet that's what a lot of us want probably still today. I don't have palm branches to hand out to all of you today, but you all got your hands. Can everybody lift their hands with me today? Everybody, wake up, there we go. (laughs) On the count of three, I want you guys to yell out Hosanna as loud as you can, and you better do good because the first service almost knocked me down when they yelled it out. And let me tell you, they're a little bit older than you guys. You guys ready? On the count of three, Hosanna. One, two, three, Hosanna. (laughs) All right, very good. Please save or save now, we cry out to our God, asking him to do exactly that for us. Except on this day, when the people are crying that out, when they're yelling, Hosanna, please save, they might want something a little different. You see, it wouldn't have been uncommon for uh, maybe someone who is a warrior to be able to come into their town, to be able to have this wonderful crowd greet him, to be able to have a parade as he marched through in this golden chariot with these big stallions, the spoils of war behind him, maybe a lot of different prisoners, and for the people to be able to celebrate this, this wonderful element. And this is what the people in this town are hoping for today as Jesus comes marching in. They want somebody to be able to save them from a lot of different things in their life, in particular from the oppression that they're under from their government. What are the things that we want from Jesus today? They had it all wrong. They did want Jesus to save them, but to save them for something very, very different. And sometimes we too probably get it wrong. We want Jesus or God to take care of our problems, to get rid of our pains, and he does come to do those things, but he comes to give us so much more. Not just what we want, but what we actually need. We'll get to that in just a minute from now. John continues on, Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. Just as it is written. These words come from the book of uh, Zechariah, chapter 9, verse 9. Uh, It's written about 500 years before uh, Jesus even comes to this world. This this prophecy is made. Now, you might not make prophecies uh, in your life, but I bet a lot of you make uh, predictions. You know, here in Arizona this year, we're going to be privileged to be able to host uh, the men's uh, Final Four basketball game. You guys know this? How many of you have filled out a bracket? Anybody? It's okay. You can fill out brackets. This isn't like a bad thing. Yeah, okay, a lot of people. And you're not the only ones. Tens of millions of people have filled out a bracket. So how many of you still have a perfect bracket? Wait a minute. Zero hands? No way, Michelle. Michelle, this is church. You cannot lie. If I were to ask not only you, but the entire world, how many people have a perfect bracket right now, the number of hands to go up would be zero. Zero. At this point, right now, you can look it up later today, nobody has a perfect bracket. Some people did very well in the beginning this year, but nobody hit a perfect bracket. Nobody was even close, and that was with only 64 teams to be able to make this simple prediction. You know what was uh, much harder to be able to do? not just to make predictions, but to actually fulfill prophecies. And this prophecy that we get from Jesus today is one of only hundreds of prophecies that Jesus fulfills. In total, Jesus fulfills about 354 different prophecies that are foretold about what our Savior will do. And I love that during this time of looking forward to Easter that we are able to look at scripture and see all those wonderful things that God has given to you and to me, these prophecies that are fulfilled in our Savior. And some of the people are capturing this in Jesus, this person that they're calling to be able to 
knock aside all the clamor of their world and to be able to see exactly what they need to see. Not what we want, but what we need. But it's hard to be able to see, even for the disciples. John says at first the disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Only after did they realize all what Jesus was telling them was completely true. Did they really capture that he was their savior? We talk about this in our world. We say hindsight is twenty twenty, right? When we are able to look back on an event in our lives and see how something transpired, see what came of that, see how maybe we would have interacted or said something differently. The disciples have that, that moment later on when they are able to look back on this. You know what the blessing is for us today? You and I have that hindsight as being our 2020 already. We don't have to look back and be with Jesus and think, I wonder if this man is the Savior. I wonder if he did come to save his people. I wonder if he's actually going to go through with it and give up his life for everyone. We have those, those words written for us. We have that historical proof provided for us. And so when we look back on Scripture, you know the truth. You know your Savior and who he is and the noise of this world that he comes to be able to remove. Paul, over and over again, tries to remind us as a church that that is the truth. And when he writes to the Philippians, he gives them these words. He says, Christ Jesus, being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. First, Paul tells them, being in very nature God. Jesus is God. But... He takes on the very nature of a servant. He becomes just like each and every one of us, even though he didn't need to. Think about what he could have done to use this to his advantage. Jesus could have come into the town that day with everybody celebrating them, uh, with everybody lifting up those hosannas to him, and he could have taken that, that throne, which technically is rightfully his, but he wants to do something very, very different. Not give us what we want, but give us what we need. In the early 1500s, there was a king in Scotland named uh, King James V. Uh, He only lived to be 30 years old. He was actually crowned uh, king at 17 months. You think our leadership is crazy, right? 17 months he became the official king And uh, during his life, he suffers a lot of different things, a lot of bad things within his family. But one of the elements he was known for is he liked to be able to take off his uh, royal robe and put it aside and take his scepter and put it down and even take off his crown and lay it aside and put on peasant clothes and go down into the town to be able to be with the people. And he'd laugh with the people and he'd spend time with the people, and he would be just like the the people. And when he was asked why he did that, he said he wanted to to be with them so he could lead better for them. Today, we celebrate a king who comes into town to do the exact same thing for us. He could have done anything to take it to his advantage, always sit upon his throne, but instead he comes down to be just like us, with us, so he can lead for us. A king who only lives in to his 30s, a king that is crowned king at a very young age when he comes to this earth, but one who decides he's gonna give up all things for us. And that's how Paul concludes. He says, in being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And Paul puts in that last piece there, not just death, but death on a cross for a very specific reason. For us to be able to remember what he took on for you and I. Because today on on Palm Sunday, we look through the lens of this celebration to be able to recognize the God who, who came for us and to be able to lift up those celebrations. Because God came to this earth to humble himself, to be in that form of Jesus so that he would take everything upon that cross that he would become a murderer for us, that he would become a thief for us, 
and ultimately that he would become sin for us. And so today we do have something to be able to celebrate. So do it with me again. Raise your hands. On the count of three, let's yell that word out again. Remember what it means. Save us. Please save. On the count of three, Hosanna. One, two, three. Hosanna!